Hello everyone, welcome to the Adoran region. I'm your host, Adoran himself, here with a different sort of video. As you may know, I'm personally a huge fan of the Pokemon Mystery Dungeon franchise. The concept behind the spin-off franchise is really cool to me, and I personally enjoy the randomness that comes with each dungeon. I've also been watching a lot of challenge videos recently, especially those of my dry bread. I've had some free time, so I thought about doing a challenge of my own. Of course, if you know me, you know that I always try to make things harder for myself. Today, all of us get to find out whether or not you could beat Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Explorers of Sky while only using Metronome. Also, a fair warning to people that are watching this video, there will be a lot of spoilers on the plot because this game is very heavily dependent on the plot, and I personally recommend playing through this game for yourself or watching a playthrough before you watch this video. In fact, I'll personally be playing through this game myself over the next few months in an Explorers of Sky series. I just wanted to warn you guys before we get started. Metronome in this franchise works very similar to how Metronome works in the main series games. The move randomly selects one of the existing moves in the game's database. Now, the interesting thing about the Mystery Dungeon games, though, is that the moves database is significantly smaller than that of the main series games. Moves, accuracy, and the importance of distance are changed between the main series games and the Mystery Dungeon franchise as well. So it'll be interesting to see how often certain moves show up, and whether or not I could use that to my advantage. Another important thing to keep in mind is that Metronome in this game has 22 power points, which is a lot more than the main series games. I shouldn't have to worry about Metronome running out of power points, especially with what I've got planned. To go through this journey with you all, I'm writing this script as I go through with the challenge, so all of this part is being written before I started. The story is split into chapters, and I'll be updating you guys throughout each chapter. Let me know what you think about whether or not I can be successful. I personally think I can, but the question is how long it'll take. I'm guessing between 0 and 100 years? Solid guess? Yeah, we'll see. Let's go over the rules before we begin. First, the only move that I'm allowed to use is Metronome. This includes me and my partner Pokemon, I'll get into that in a little bit. I can't use the regular attack as well, which I'll go into in a little bit as well. I can't use any glitches or exploits, I also can't use any items in battle except held items. Now, this might be a little bit confusing, especially to those of you who have played the games, so I'll put it like this. I can't use any items while in battle with another Pokemon. That means no seeds, that includes reviver seeds, no orbs, no healing in the middle of fights, and other similar sorts of things. If there's no Pokemon near me, I can heal myself, but it'll still be tough to deal with. My only exception is held items, which my partner and I can each have one. Also, since I'm playing the game on a, a special device, uh, there is the option of save states. I'm going to try my hardest not to use them, but some of the cutscenes and dungeons before boss battles are extremely long, especially later in the game, so I'm going to use them as a last resort if necessary. If you enjoy the video, like, comment, subscribe, ring the bell, and do all those important things that you ought to do when supporting a YouTube channel. With that said, let's dive on in. I start off by modifying the game to make sure that I can get a starter that can learn Metronome. See, one of the biggest issues when it comes to this challenge is that none of the starter Pokemon in this game have Metronome to start off with. To make it reasonable, I changed the game so that I could start with Munchlax. Munchlax is a Pokemon that you could be in Explorers of Time and Darkness, the previous versions of Sky, which is the game I'm playing right now. Uh, think of it like the Diamond and Pearl to Platinum. In this game, Munchlax can only be a partner Pokemon, so I just fixed it up so Munchlax can be the main player character. I also changed the game so that my partner, who I chose to be Skitty, could also learn Metronome, and only Metronome. One last change to the game, I made Munchlax a Nun type so that I can partner with Skitty. The game's code prevents you and your partner from sharing a type, but a quick change here fixes that. Don't worry, in the first dungeon I'm able to change Munchlax back to a normal type, so I don't have any advantages or disadvantages from being a nun type. Without further ado, let's dive into the story, because that's what this game is all about. I start off waking up on a beach, with no idea how I got there. Meanwhile, a skitty seems to be walking in front of some building with a really cool Pokemon in front, but is too chicken to walk over a grate. This skitty, who seems to be named Subscribe, walks away, followed by a couple of totally not suspicious people. After Subscribe walks to the beach, they find a Munchlax clearly starving, and offers words as nourishment. Then Subscribe loses a rock and drags me with them no matter how hard I tried to avoid it. I'll go through the entire dungeon while I explain how things are set up, especially since it's a short one. Both Skitty and I have 4 move slots full of metronome and only metronome. That means we've got 88 power points of the move, which should be more than enough. If either of us learn another move, though I don't know if changing the code would mess with that, I'd just make sure that the new move wouldn't be learned. Also, from this point forward, I'll mainly be showing major parts of the story, unless I'm in a dungeon and faint, recruit someone, which will be explained later on, or if it's a situation that I just find interesting to talk about. Anyway, we steamroll through the dungeon and fight the first boss fight. 
I should also mention, because I didn't write this down in my script, that you have the option of using a regular attack, which in this game is just you charging the foe and hitting them, almost like a tackle attack. Uh, I will not be using that at all during this run, uh, because it's extremely important to have this be metronome and only metronome, and technically that's another attack that I could use, so that is not allowed. Only metronome. Now it's funny, I have boss fight in quotes, like air quotes in my script, because that's basically what this is. It's a really easy fight. Metronome having the chance to use some powerful moves really helps out. The fight takes about 12.3 seconds and we get the rock back. After a bit of discussion, Subscribe asks for me to join a rescue team, whatever that is. I try to get out of the challenge, realizing that the grind that eventually will come is going to be too much for me, but Subscribe forces me to do the grind anyway, so I decide, what the hey, I'm this far in. Time to head to a guild? We see our friend walk onto a grate, get yelled at for a bit, and we walk on the grate as well. Apparently this is the big task that you've got to pass to join the guild, and I'm telling you, it's tough as heck. Anyway, we walk in after some feet problems and meet one of the greatest characters of all time. Chata comes in and tells us we shouldn't do the whole recruiting thing, and then accepts us as we have no other place to go. And then we meet, and I'm saying this seriously, the greatest Pokemon of all time, Wigglytuff, as he gives us some stuff we can use for our task. Uh, I should probably point out for those of you that don't know me that well, uh, Wigglytuff is my favorite Pokemon, mainly because of this Wigglytuff, so uh, I very much enjoyed this character. I also named the team Not A Scratch, though it's spelled wrong, for Not A Scratch, my Pokemon Mystery Dungeon TTRPG actual play podcast that's over 30 episodes in. You should check it out wherever you listen to podcasts. It's like D&D, but it's Pokemon Mystery Dungeon, wink wink, nudge nudge, etc. Uh, also, I should point out something earlier. When you take the personality quiz to determine what starter Pokemon you are, your aura is tested to see what color you are. With that, you get a specific color bow from Wigglytuff. My bow was actually a deep green or Viridian. I knew that if I didn't say what I got, you'd all ask. Actually, now that I think about it, everyone ask anyway. Comments are good for the YouTube algorithm. Or, so I've heard at least. I don't know, I'm relatively new to this whole thing. Anyway, after some yum tying, Chatout leads us to our beds, and we sleep after a discussion under the stars. The next morning we wake up late and learn some important lessons about life from the goat Wigglytuff, and some lessons about guild work as well. This is followed by Chatout telling us what to do. Instead of exploring new mysterious places, we're told to go find a pearl someone dropped somewhere. We protest until we see that it's a spoink, and knowing about spoinks need to have that pearl to basically survive, we accept. I probably won't be showing you much of the dungeons from this point forward unless something interesting happens, but while we're here, I want to shout out all of the different Pokemon challenge peoples that I've watched over the past few years. So, shout out to my Drybread, Johnstone, Pika Spray, Small Ant, Pokemon, and basically anyone else that's ever attempted a Pokemon challenge. A special shout out to my Drybread, as I've been studying his How to Make a Pokemon Challenge series on his channel. It makes this challenge significantly easier to edit and work with, though. Uh, I didn't listen to the, the entirety of it, as evidenced by my absolutely brilliant decision to record this entire challenge and make a compilation video that no one will watch, uh, unless you want to, it's in the uh, description and the pinned comment. Anyway, shout out to all of you, special shout out to my driver, and I'll start hating you when I get to tough boss battles. Maybe. We'll see. Wait a minute, um... So guess what, that's death number one, and it's from my ally's magnitude. See, I figured something like this would happen, but I didn't think it would happen so soon. I'm actually curious, because you're not supposed to fail this dungeon. Uh, the new dialogue is the chat outs part, because the dinner thing occurs if you succeed as well. Well, that, that was interesting. Anyway, this time we bring the pearl back to Spoink, and they give us 2,000 poke, which is amazing, until chat out takes 90% of it because we work for the guild. I understand taking a portion of it, but 90%? We've got no choice though, so we accept the 200 poke, the items, of which thankfully 90% are not taken, and call it a day after some good eats. We wake the next morning and Chatot yells, I mean, instructs us, some more about our tasks. We then meet the greatest Bidoof of all time, uh, that's how I pronounce it, you can at me if it's wrong, because it probably is, who along with subscribe gives us a rundown of the city and all of its facilities. We meet up with Nazural and Meryl, who rob Kecleon and get away with it, and meet a drowsy that tells them where some lost item is located. Along the way, Adurin, aka me, starts getting some weird visions about an evil drowsy and a scared Nazural. I doubt those are related, so we just head back to the guild only to find out that surprise surprise they were related! Oh my gosh! From there, we rush off and head to the next dungeon, Mount Bristle. On the very first floor, I apparently want revenge on subscribe and use my own magnitude. Unlike subscribe though, I can control my magnitude not to destroy my allies. Are you listening? On the fifth floor, a spinnerack nearly takes us both out, but we're able to save it at the last moment. 
on the ninth floor, fighting types. Yeah, I fully expect them to be a pain throughout this challenge. When we reached the peak, we saw what my vision saw. Drowsy, trying to be a meanie. Naturally, the solution to the problem is throwing two children at the bad guy to see what happens. Finally, our first boss fight that I was worried about. I sometimes had trouble with this fight when I had access to all of my facilities. Now with only Metronome, I thought this was going to be tough. It turns out, we almost both fainted. Jeez, I will never ever like this fight. Luckily for us, we were able to survive, get some clutch status effects, and bingo, Drowsy was down. Over the rest of our day, we bring Drowsy to the authorities and think about the dream sequence that led to these events. After some food and rest, both of us agree, we aren't being paid enough for this. Subscribe also teaches us about time gears and their importance to the world. It seems that time gears are what makes time continue to work properly, or something like that, I don't really know, I wasn't listening. Hey, don't look at me like that, I'm a munchlax. Eat, sleep, and dream about getting new Twitter followers, that's all I'm supposed to do. By the way, you should follow me on Twitter, I tweet about stuff like uh, what everyone else does, but with my personal little spice added in. After waking up, Chadot tells us to work on missions. Periodically during the story, there are days like this with no real plot progression. For the rest of the challenge, I'll skip over them unless something interesting happens. While prepping for missions, I see the Spinda staring at this big rock. Don't know what that's about, but I suppose they know what they're doing. I head down to the beach, and it seems like someone is littering. The poor Krabby are having bottles wash up on their beach, and they seem to be filled with missions. How could these Pokemon that need help litter just to get saved? So I do the honorable thing and start picking up after everyone, like a true protagonist. The day ends with some rewards for missions before heading to bed. Unlike other mornings, Loudred yells at us a bit more as we're supposed to take the role of gatekeeper today. Despite Loudred getting through all the instructions without screaming once, I still can't understand what he's saying, so he yells some more and I get the gist. Feet determine whether or not people are suspicious of being criminals, which makes no sense. I mean, why would suspicious Pokemon want to walk into a guild? Anyway, we go through the job because we could get some cool items and call it a day from here. We followed this up with another day of missions, but today it seems like there's a why not and Wobbuffet outside of the big rock. Again, not sure about why, but subscribe and I rolled with it. On the fourth floor, I nearly faint thanks to some terrible metronome lock. And on the fifth floor, I actually faint. Let's try this again, shall we? We get through the missions this time without too much trouble and get a few rewards, including a power band, which could be really useful in the future. This morning starts off normally until Chadot tells us that the time gear in Treeshod Forest was stolen. Time is apparently stopped in the forest, which is a wild concept to think about. We're also assigned to go to a waterfall and explore it, so we pack up and head off. Before we can, Chimeko calls us over and talks about recruiting other members to join Team Not A Scratch. Normally this could be really useful, but since this is a metronome-only run, I can't risk having a metronome join us and not use metronome. If anyone tries to join, we'll just have to refuse. When we leave the guild, there's something interesting. That rock that was once there seems to have disappeared. On top of that, there's some stairs. Apparently that Spinda from earlier is opening a shop of some kind? Interesting. We'll check it out soon. At the waterfall, we can't seem to find any way of exploring more, until I have the brilliant idea of jumping through the waterfall. Subscribe gets a bit nervous, and who can blame her? I mean, it's not like we've known each other for that long of a time, why should she trust me? But then she says a line that I quote way too often in real life. Be brave. Be the bravest ever. We decide to jump on three, count to four, and presto, there's a cave to explore behind the falls. Time to get exploring. Ho hold up, hold up, wait, wait, wait. Uh, what did Subscribe just say? Be brave, use all your courage? I, I never knew that. I've been playing through this game a bunch of times, but the line has always been, be brave, be the bravest ever. That's surprising. On the third floor, a Psyduck joins the team. Now, if they want to join, all they got to do is follow subscribe. That didn't work as well as I thought it would. Anyway, since they don't have metronome, they get sent home, because I realized that you could just send them home and they won't have to worry about, you know, metronoming. I'm curious how many Pokemon we will recruit, so I'm just counting up. There's a tracker on the right next to the death count. On the seventh floor, we get a Poliwag to join us. I'll also mention I'm going to accept everyone, so duplicates are allowed. We reach the end of the dungeon and see about 300 million Poke worth of gems, including a massive one the size of a Pokemon at the end. After a few tries from each of us, I get a vision that pushing the gem will lead to a massive water flow. Guess which curious cat decides to push the gem. The flood leads us to flying out of a geyser and landing in a hot spring, where both of us decide to chill after an extremely long day. Chatot and Subscribe are extremely hype after we filled our report, but my visions revealed that Wigglytuff, the MVP, had already been there. Chatot roasts us for a bit before confirming what we already knew, and we hit to dinner slightly more disappointed from there. That night, Subscribe and Adoran have some motivational conversation before the Guildmaster asks for us to visit his office. Turns out that there's an expedition being planned soon, and rookies, us, are being considered for the first time ever, or at least in a long time. Before we get inflated egos though, Chadot makes sure to tell us that if we screw up, we're not going. 
So, we decide to work hard and push forward as we head to the next day. The next morning comes and more details are given about this expedition. Our jobs that day? Continue doing missions. You know, nothing wild. That is, until we approach the mission boards. Look who it is! Our old friends Batman and Robin seem to have shown up, but their boss comes in with a whole different attitude. That skunk tank had the nerve to attack me, and I couldn't do anything about it. After a brief scare and calling my subscribers chickens... No, 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 wait, not you guys. Uh, back to missions we go. Yeah, let's, let's do that. Well, we would, except that shop place is open. Turns out that there are two shops in that place where the rock was. The first is Spinda's Cafe, where gummies and other food items can be used to turn into juices and other drinks that will not only increase IQ, but also could increase stats. The second one is the Recycle Center, where items that I have no need for could be traded in for items that are useful. When leaving Spinda's shop, we meet with Chimeko, who mentions that team members could meet in the cafe instead of the watering hole area up above. After refusing, Chimeko breaks the fourth wall and forces us to choose yes. Does Chimeko know what's going on? A anyway, that's a thing now. I'm slightly concerned. You might be wondering why both Subscribe and I have power bands. Really, it has to do with data analysis. So fun. First of all, remember that chart really early on in the video that shows the different types of moves that Metronome could land on? Well, I decided to analyze that data to find out what types of move would show up most frequently and whether they were special, physical, or its status moves. From there, I've decided to basically optimize subscribe and endurance style of play with different held items and everything. Is this overkill? Yeah, but is this necessary? Maybe, to be honest, I really don't want to find out. Anyway, after the analysis, which you can see through the power of sped up footage, we find some interesting results. I will say that I'm not 100% sure if the data is perfect, but it's good enough for how we're going to play. After analyzing the data, I found that of the 168 moves that Metronome can become, 86 of them are physical damaging moves, 49 are status, and 33 are special moves. This is the big thing that I want to look at, though it was interesting to see the type distribution of the moves. Anyway, the big thing is that our attack should be boosted as high as possible, as it's the thing that's most likely going to be used. That being said, it makes sense that both subscribe and skitty- I have subscribe and si skitty? What? No. That's not right. With that being said, it makes sense that both Subscribe and Adorin boost their attack with a power band. On top of that, if I feel like our stats are slacking a bit, I'll take advantage of Spinda's Cafe to boost our stats. That shouldn't be an issue right now, though it could be very soon. We recruit a Shellos on the 6th floor of Drench Bluff while doing missions. A successful day in the bank, we get some more rewards before something is brought to my attention. Uh, storage space. You see, in this game, we only have a limited amount of storage space at Kangaskhan storage, and that could be a problem considering I'm probably not going to be using too many items. It's something to keep in mind, though there are ways to just use them, like a cafe or recycler. The next day comes around and we've got to look at feet again. Uh, we do our job and end up getting even more items and stuff for doing such a good job. Also, can you look at that score? 9997. So close to straight nines. Don't know what that would mean, because you can break 10,000, I've done that before, but it would have been hilarious to get that far. We wake up the next morning to hear that Team Skull has decided to join us. How fun. In fact, none of the guild members are particularly thrilled, and Wigglytuff is getting mad. Like, destroying the guild out of pure rage mad. So we fake it here and book it before Wigglytuff realizes that we don't believe it, and subscribe and I work to do more missions. We recruit an Anorith on the second floor of Drench Bluff while doing missions. We recruit a Chingling on the fourth floor. We get a bunch of rewards and head out to eat dinner before going to bed. Nothing happens in the night. Absolutely nothing. How would I know what happens in the night? I'm asleep, remember? Anyway, we wake up the next morning to find that we're short on food, and Subscribe and I are the ones that have to go get the food. What could go wrong? In the dungeon, we recruit a Hoppip on the second floor. We also get a Badoo on the fourth floor. We reach the end of Apple Woods and find the perfect apples. But what do you know? Team Skell is there. They're willing to help us get the perfect apples. Or so you think. Naturally, Subscribe doesn't fall for this trick, and instead we get blasted with the noxious gas combo, which also hits their Zubat. Unfortunately, we fail to bring Perfect Apples back, but Wigglytuff and I have a connection, man. He'll be okay with it, right? Uh. At the last second, Team Skull comes in with a Perfect Apple, saving all of us and potentially the entire town from Wigglytuff's wrath. Also, and I really should mention this, our punishment was no dinner. Tell me, when's the last time a Munchlax was forced not to eat a meal? That's actually illegal in Section 4, Amendment 2, Article 3 of the Constitution. Or so I've heard, I don't know, I'm a Munchlax, we don't have time to read the Constitution. The next morning, Chatout mentions that the expedition group will be picked over the next few days. He also calls us over to tell us that we've got no chance of making it. And to be honest, I kind of agree with him. We've got no idea what Wigglytuff is thinking, he could hate us. More importantly, he could hate me, which would be tragic for my career as a Wigglytuff stan. 
After that, however, super secret agent Badoof sneaks past a wide awake Krogunk with some Flora and Chime Echo to give us some apples to revitalize ourselves. The squad's got our back and we've got theirs. Hashtag dream. Hashtag dream work? Is that what I was about to say? Hashtag teamwork. Besides that, though, today is another day of working on missions, so I'll be back when I get an interesting update. Hold up slightly future me here, like 20 seconds, to show you that Krogunk has fixed his cauldron and his swap shop is workable. I'm probably not going to use this because it's another one of those hold items to boost stats thing like the power bands are, but it could be interesting in case we come into a rough patch or find an interesting item. Okay, back to missions, see you in a bit. As we walk out of the guild, it seems like there's some sort of event happening at the cafe. Subscribe and I check it out to find that the cafe is starting Project P, a way to get better recycled items. Now, since we're not likely to be recycling at all, this probably won't impact as much, if at all, but it's cool nonetheless. So, we've run into a slight issue, uh, that storage space problem that I was talking about before. Seems like we've run out of space to store items, which is a slight issue. Now, there are ways around this, like doing special missions and taking items out while doing these, or recycling items. Since I want to use those as little as possible, I'm probably just going to sell duplicate items that aren't useful and keep the money, which at this point I'm basically doing to buy more gummies for stat boosts. After all, we can't buy moves, nor can we use most of the high cost items anyway. We recruit a chingling on the third floor of the Drench Bluff while doing missions. Also, this geodude is spamming rock polish and mud support, which is very annoying. Could you stop, please? While doing a criminal mission, we have the dreaded multi-hit attacks on me, and I'm knocked out. That's disappointing. We lose the chingling that we recruited and also will likely have to do the, the geodude mission again. That mission is the last one we need to unlock the next rank, which increases storage space. I'm done for today, I'll come back to this tomorrow. A new day of recording! Surely nothing could go wrong! Ugh. Take three. Actually, you know what? I'm just gonna save myself some time and just clear up the extra space by selling apples and berries. I just really don't want to deal with A, that geodude, and B, that beetroll. I'll do some easier missions and hopefully that doesn't make things more problematic. So, instead of doing the same missions, I decide to do some beach cave missions. Before that, I sell most of the items that aren't useful for this challenge like extra regular apples, sleep and stun seeds, orbs, and other things. Since I can't use them in battle, they're pretty pointless to have anyway. Alright, let's look at the missions I have. Deliver one sleep seed. But didn't I just... You know what? Delete it. I don't care. It's too early in the morning, as of this part of the writing. To deal with it, we'll just figure it out later. We get some missions done, but not nearly enough points to level up. We'll have to wait until the next mission date. The next day, sentry duty. Nothing special, didn't break the high score or anything, just got some solid items and a couple bucks. While doing missions on the third floor, we recruit a barboach. We finished our missions and earned enough mission points to become silver rank. Thankfully, our storage has increased from 96 to 200, which should be enough space for at least the next few chapters. I'm actually glad, because this was one of the issues that I was worried about when starting this challenge. At dinner, Chadot has a special announcement. It looks like the final guild members have been decided, and the next morning's briefings will tell us if we made the cut. Subscribe and I are both nervous, though. We did fail Lord Wigglytuff in one of his most important tasks, and he could still be mad about that. Guess we'll have to wait until tomorrow to find out. The next morning is here, and Wigglytuff has the team. We'll finally get to see if we made the team or not. Down the list we go, and even Bidoof made the team. Good for him. But we reach the end of the list, and it seems we aren't chosen for the- Wait a minute. We are. Wait, that's everyone. Yep. Wigglytuff, Master of Men, has brilliantly decided that all of the members of the guild get to go on the expedition. Despite Team Skull's disapproval, it's going to be a full guild expedition. Time to pack up, get ready, and hear what we're going to do. According to Chatout, there's a mysterious place called Fogbound Lake, located a good distance away from the guild. It's said that there's a great treasure there, and it's our job to find it. The guild will separate into different teams and take different paths to the guild, and Subscribe and Adoran are going to be partnering with Bidoof as we travel to the meetup point. Sounds like fun. Also, Wigglytuff calls Chatout a mini, which is the best roast of the year. Yes, it's very early in the year, but best roast of the year anyway. Bidoof, Subscribe, and Adoran all start traveling and reach a huge mountainside where we have the option of going down two different paths. The Pokemon Mystery Dungeon games do this sometimes, where you could go down an easier training dungeon, but it reverts you back to the place where you started at. In this journey, I'm going to try to progress the plot in all instances like this, so we head through the Craggy Coast. Now you might have noticed that the ally Pokemon, so the guys that aren't me or Subscribe, aren't using only Metronome. Now I've tried to figure out how to fix that, but I'm not 100% sure how to do so. Changing the code doesn't seem to be working, so the challenge is more like can I beat the game when my partner and I only use Metronome. Not as pure of a challenge, but effectively the same thing, especially since I can't control Bidoof anyway. On the 6th floor, I get confused and end up nearly taking out my entire team, so that was not great. After getting through the dungeon, we take a break for food at the base of the mountain. Next morning, it's time to see if we can make it through Mount Horn. 
While going through the dungeon, I actually noticed something interesting. Bidoof actually levels up between the two dungeons. He was level 14 in the previous one, he's level 16 now. Apparently a quick dinner of joy seeds is what Bidoof ate last night. On the 11th floor, Bidoof nearly faints again. I normally think Bidoof is a solid Pokemon when he isn't growling all the time in this dungeon, but he's not doing so hot this time around. All three of us make it to the base camp, only to find out that everyone's actually been here for at least a day already. Guess we took the long way around. Though, something about this place is peculiar to Adoran, to, to me. Chada goes on to explain the goals of the exploration, and Chimeko talks about a legend of Yuxi, a Pokemon that's said to be the guardian of Fogbound Lake, and has the power to wipe memories from those who visit? Maybe he's the reason why my memories are gone. Also, never realized this until now, but apparently Yuxi is a he in this universe? That's interesting. Anyway, the groups disperse and we get to traveling as Adoran continues to think about why this place is so familiar. Then Subscribe finds some interesting red gem and decides to hold on to it. Wonder what it could be. We go through the dungeon without any issues and then end up in a really densely foggy area of the forest. While there, we meet with Corfish, who shows us a somewhat broken statue of a Pokemon. After examining it for a bit, I touch it and get a couple of visions, though it's just words being said. Remember that stone that Subscribe picked up? Once we place that in the statue's heart, the fog clears up. We can see the real Fogbound Lake, and it's not what we expected. Once the fog clears, Corfish goes back to report while we're supposed to go ahead, but Team Skull comes in to try to steal our spotlight. The fight of the century is about to go down when Wigglytuff shows up and tells us to basically do our job. So we head out, and I'm personally relieved to not deal with the noxious gas combo again. Team Skull seems to want to pick a fight with Wigglytuff for some treasure that he has as well. Not sure what will happen with that, but we've got a job to do. We reach the entrance of the cave where we see a bunch of steam. Looks like this will be a hot dungeon. I stock up and head on to Steam Cave. Seems also that Wigglytuff is fighting with Team Skull and it's a face off. Literally. I will not apologize for that joke. It was a solid one and I stand by that. We reach the halfway point and hear some weird sounds, but both Subscribe and Adoran aren't sure what that noise is. Whatever. As we head up top, the sound shows up again and we get motivated to continue after Adoran shares what's been going on since coming to the base camp. Also, Subscribe says I beg your pardon, which I find absolutely amazing. Alright, time to go. On one of the last floors, Subscribe falls due to low health and me making a poor tactical decision. Alright, let's reset. We get through without too much trouble this time and we hear some loud noises. Turns out we've disturbed the Guardian of the Fortress, and it's Groudon. Oh boy. Meanwhile, the rest of the guild reaches the statue and starts to catch up to where we are. Also, Wigglytuff apparently destroys Team Skull like they're a bunch of grunts, which they technically are. Also, according to Chatout, fighting against Groudon is a death wish, so let's fight Groudon. The strategy behind most of these boss battles is pretty straightforward. Make sure that both Subscribe and I are next to the boss and try to get off as many status effects as possible. We got Groudon paralyzed a couple times, lowered accuracy, got them confused, and slowed them down too, which made the entire battle much easier. Since we don't have any control over our attacks, it's very much a how lucky we are battle, as if that's not the entire challenge. With the final submission, Subscribe takes out Groudon and we win the battle. Anyway, Subscribe out here like, bro, Groudon? More like Groudgon. Yeah, cool kids in the house. Okay, fine. And we win the fight. So that's uh, another boss battle that we won. Let's uh, check out the plot. We get to see the real treasure of Fogbound Lake, a time gear. Something we clearly can't take, as mentioned previously. Wigglytuff and the rest of the guild come soon afterwards to soak in the view, make new friends with both Yuxi and Groudon, and understand the true nature of Fogbound Lake. Unfortunately for us, Yuxi has no idea who we are, nor has he met us before when we were a human. But we somehow knew about this place. Very odd, and something that's interesting to consider. Otherwise though, we've done our duty. We've explored Fogbound Lake, discovered its treasure, and promised not to mention it to anyone. I guess at this point, it's back to get to the normal guild grind. We wake up the next morning seemingly going about our normal work when it turns out that Diglett has some unknown visitor at the gate. It's apparently Dustnor, an extremely famous, relatively new explorer, and he's come to visit Wigglytuff. Wigglytuff being the sly guy that he is doesn't mention anything about Fogbound Lake, but Dustnor's in town for a bit, which will be fun conversations. Otherwise, a normal mission day, so I'll be back when something interesting happens. So they've been clogging our job list for a while, so we finally do the Drench Bluff missions, and they were remarkably easy. Didn't have any issues or problems with the missions, so we head to bed. Nothing really interesting outside of that, though it seems that Team Skull has returned after getting destroyed by Wigglytuff. Hope they aren't an issue in the future. 
The next day before doing our missions, Chattel asks us to see if Kecleon's planning on stocking perfect apples. It seems that someone is raiding the storage regularly. No idea who that would be. Anyway, when we head down there to check it out, Dustnor is having a conversation with them. Seems that they aren't planning to sell perfect apples, which is a shame. Though our mood is bright when Meryl and Nazir will come to say that their special item, a water float, might be on the beach. Good for them, they seem like good people. Or good Pokemon, I guess. Anyway, we report back and Chaddock gets flashbacks of bad times before telling us to go work on missions. Well, see you when they're done. Missions done, nothing fantastic about them. Though when we head to dinner, we hear some bad news. Apparently another time gear was stolen. While it wasn't the one from Fogbound Lake, it's still concerning the time gears are getting stolen. Hopefully nothing is happening in Fogbound Lake. I doubt that would happen, though we'd have to be insanely unlucky for another time gear to be stolen so soon after the first two. We wake up the next morning to hear some rough news. Meryl and Azuro's water float has been stolen and put up for ransom. It's in some place called the Amp Plains, which sounds like a load of fun, but it's up for us to go find them. We pack up and head on out there. This dungeon is tough for multiple reasons, so my plan is to go in with very little, just our power bands and a big apple, and see if we're able to stand up to everyone. If we're able to win, great. If not, I'll reset and boost our stats by using the gummies we've been saving up. On the third floor, we recruit an Elekid. So this dungeon is a tough one, because the opponent's Pokemon are dealing regular large damage, and it's kind of concerning. We've gotten by so far, but it's going to be interesting to see what the future looks like. Also, we're apparently in trouble because Amp Plains has something bad in them at this time of year. This is at least according to the Kecleon Bros, the Water Bros, and the Dustnor Bro? Well, let's see if we can make it to the end of the dungeon. Nope, this part is way too tough. It's time to boost our stats. It's time to use the cafe. Over the course of what felt like hours, but probably wasn't, I used every gummy we had to boost all of our IQs and stats as much as we could. You can see a sped up version on the screen of the event. You can also see on the bottom right the old stats and the new stats. We're boosted up and with a potential level up in the dungeon, that could be enough for us to get to the end. Let's find out now. Halfway through and it's pretty easy so far. We'll see if that lasts into the part that knocked us out last time. On the fourth floor for the first time in the series, I find the secret bazaar. It's a special place where you can get grab bags, a quick heal, cleaned items, or escape the dungeon if you like. It's an interesting place. I've got room in my bag and 300 poke to spend, so I buy three grab bags and get two power pants and an orange berry. That's a profit at the very least. Let's move on. On the sixth floor, it's a monster house. I can't remember if the game increases the chances of monster houses on these floors, but that does sound familiar to me. My strategy is simple. Run. Luckily, we found a pure seed earlier in the dungeon, so I make sure that subscribe runs away, and I eat the pure seed to warp to the stairs. It works perfectly, and we move on to the next area. On the ninth floor, both of us nearly faint to a mad Tauros. Not fun, I must say. We finally reach the end of Amp Plains and see the water float. As we approach it, though, we're attacked by a Manetric and some Electrics. Time to battle. It doesn't go well. There's just too many Pokemon that we have to fight, and I don't think our current setup works well for what we want to do. We lose quick, and I think we might have to head back and find a way to train some more. So I've been researching on the stats of the Pokemon we've got to fight, and the biggest issue is simply the number of Pokemon. The Electrics all have around 40-ish health, while the Manetric has health somewhere in the 150s, and this is all based on watching other playthroughs. The big thing is that we've got to somehow be able to get rid of multiple Electrics while not fainting to the others, including the Manetric. Basically, we've got to regularly be able to deal 40 damage, and rely on luck to hope that we get some really good moves. Time to train. The best place for practice against Electric types without the worry of fainting is probably Marowak's Dojo. Just sit around and train for a while. I'll... See you guys when I get some extra levels. While training in the dungeon and doing missions, I recruit a Shellos and a Lily. We also recruit a Geodude. I fainted in this dungeon to a boss battle. I also use a few more gummies to boost a few stats a bit more. I think it's time to try again. Did I say try again? I meant try again now. This attempt has been so far pretty smooth, though we'll see exactly how far we can go with what we got. On the 8th floor, I nearly get knocked out by a Fury attack, but we find the secret bazaar. It's probably a wasted poke, but I heal us up for 100 just because I'm worried about the next floor. I also should mention that I'm really starting to see the real benefit of Skitty's Normalize. Since Skitty gets stabbed on all of her moves, everything she hits is basically a one-hit KO, especially if it's a physical move. Let's see if this carries over. With these battles, we can have one of two different strategies, either take out the main boss or take out the underlings. I decided to go for the minions, and we get rid of three of them really quickly. With my IQ ability to shield subscribe if she gets low health in play, I make sure that she plays like a hard hitter while I sort of play backup support. A lucky confusion on one of the Electrics and an accuracy lowering on the Manetric helps a lot, along with some pretty bad tactics by the Electrics. So, we did it. We finally won. Despite that though, it looks like the Manetric and Electrics are going to finish us off when Dustnor arrives. He talks some sense into the Manetric, and we're able to get the water fluid after they leave. 
Though, you have to wonder, who put the water flow there? In the surprise of the century, it turns out that Team Skull was behind it all. They're a bunch of chickens, though, scared of us. Mostly Dustnor. So they run away and we get to deliver the water flow to the Bubble Bros. That's the first thing that came to my mind, so I'm staying with it. As we deliver the water flow to the Bubble Bros, they and the Kecleon Bros are praising us and Dustnor about our greatness. Though to be honest, like Subscribe says, it's sent to these weird dreams I have and- Wait, Dustnor knows what this is? The Dimensional Screen. How fascinating. Why don't we talk about it some more? We head to the beach where I was found and tell him all about how I was a human that turned into a Pokemon. After telling him my name though, he seems to smile a bit? Don't know what that was about, though I guess Adorin is a pretty funny and weird name. He goes into a bit of an explanation about the dimensional scream and offers his full support for us, which is great. We see a lot of Pelipper flying around though, which is typically a sign of some bad news. Then Madoof comes and blurts something about all guild members needing to report to the guild. Why would that be- Wait, we're guild members. Let's go. When we head to the guild, it's bad news. Another time gear has been stolen. And this time, it's the one at Fogbound Lake. Yuxi's alright, but that's now three time gears. That's a problem for all of us, and we've got to figure out how to stop it. Wigglytuff puts on his coach's hat and gives us a rousing speech for the guild, and even Dustnor is willing to help. Time to prep and get ready for an expedition, though I'm not quite sure where we're going. Dustnor, Wigglytuff, and Chatot have worked together to find a list of places the time gears could potentially be at. If we can figure out where the time gears are, we can figure out where Grovile plans to go. We've been assigned to go to the northern desert, with sandstorms and terror galore. You ready? Let's head there now. On the fourth floor, I step into a trap that nearly leads to me being knocked out by back-to-back self-destructs. On the fifth floor, I nearly faint again. I'm starting to think I'm a bit underleveled. On the seventh floor, we recruit a trap inch. On the fourteenth floor, we recruit a Rhyhorn. We reach the end of the dungeon only to find a bunch of quicksand. It seems like going any further would suck us into the quicksand and that would be dangerous. While it looks like we've got nowhere to go but back, I have this odd feeling that I've seen or been at this place before. Anyway, let's head back to the guild. Coming back to the guild doesn't help our mood too much, as everyone seems to have failed at finding anything where they were. The only thing that all of us were able to bring back was tired feet and Bidoof's crystal. Guess we'll find a new strategy tomorrow. The next day rolls around and it's up to us to go exploring on our own, while Chatot and Dustnor devise a new strategy. The weird feeling about the quicksand place is really bugging me though, so I tell Subscribe and she agrees with me. We should head back to that area and find out what to do. Let's go. When we reach the quicksand desert, it looks exactly like it did the previous day. Lots of quicksand. Too much quicksand, in fact. Maybe that's it. Maybe we've got to use the quicksand to our advantage and actually, you know, jump into the quicksand. Is it foolish? Possibly. But has the feeling ever steered us wrong? As of now, I don't think so, so let's dive on in. Turns out I was right. There's a cave underneath that we can, and probably should, explore. Y you know what? Let's actually do that now. Let's, let's go. On the first floor, I accidentally used magnitude. That's not the big thing, I've done that before. The big thing is that I become infatuated with subscribe. So you heard it here first, Adorin is in love with his subscribers. I don't know if that necessarily incentivizes you to subscribe, but you can't say I don't like y'all. Anyway, let's never speak of this again and move forward. On the third floor, we simply get beat due to bad luck. We might have to be a bit higher level or have a few more stat points before we're ready to take this dungeon on. Also, that infatuation thing is no longer canon because I reset, so haha. Try to do some missions, but fail to that Arios. Again. Let's just try the dungeon again. Maybe it was bad luck? On the 10th floor, I end up fainting to a monster house where the stairs were. It's bad luck. We'll have another attempt. On the first floor of this next attempt, Subscribe gets poisoned and nearly faints to roll out another one of those dreaded multi-hit moves. So I'm halfway through and for some reason it's not too bad. There's some struggles, but not nearly as much as I thought there would be. Hopefully that carries over to the next section. The first floor, a monster house on the stairs room. I tried to stall so that Subscribe could move away and find a way around, but I lose my power band and eventually lose to a distance attack. Luckily I save, so I'll try again from here. On the second run through, it's a pretty solid run until the sixth floor. There we go against the Sand Slash and Tyranitar, two tough but fair Pokemon to see in this dungeon. Then after some back and forth damage, I do a large magnitude and Subscribe lives on literally one health as I take out the remaining Pokemon. We were that close to losing on this run through. Jesus is draining on my health. Anyway, let's move on. A couple of floors later, I do a regular attack on a Tyranitar while he's confused. That's bad, since this is a metronome-only run. So, because I messed up, it's time to restart. We were nine floors in and had some good luck. This is incredibly disappointing. This doesn't count as a death, though. I guess we could keep track of a door and mess-ups or something. There we go. Nope, not talking about it. Let's just move on. On this run, we recruited a Skaroopy. 
Also, you may have noticed that I've got two characters named Five, and I'm possibly doing that here again. I don't actually know. And we've got to cancel this run because I used an item in battle. Something's up with me today, apparently, because I've decided to choke on all of the attempts so far. Then, early on this run, Monster House. I don't even try it, I just counted it as a death. Another Monster House. Ignore the fact that we recruited a mobile earlier. Here's the thing, when I try to reset this run, I get sent to what happens after the death. All of my items and all of my poke are gone and we leveled up the way that we were during this run. So that's a thing. At this point, I'm literally not prepared to do this dungeon, so we've got to head back. We've lost everything we've brought and picked up, so we've got to do all this all over again. We recruit an allocate while doing training missions, so that's the real 19, uh, assuming I'm on track. I found out that I forgot to mention the Badoo that we had was 19, so actually we're at 20. Again, if we're on track. While doing missions, one of the rewards gets us a Sandshrew as a new recruit. After a bit more training and some extra gummies, boosting our IQ, here are our current stats. I think this could potentially be good enough, especially with some good luck in the items we've got. Let's see if we can make it through this time. At the halfway point, and things are pretty easy. There weren't any struggles this time, which is both great and concerning. Now it's the hard part, getting through the second half. Think we can get it done without any deaths? Let's find out. So that's a nope, let's try this again. Gosh, I don't even sound confident. On the first floor, we recruit a Skarupi. That's technically number 22, if we keep this run. Again, if we're on track. And sure enough, I use a regular attack. Again, I was so good about this on all of the other dungeons, but apparently now I don't know anything. On the second floor of the next run, we land next to the stairs, but it's a monster house. All we have to do is survive one turn. Thankfully, we're able to. Let's get out of here. Then we get hit by a pin missile from a billion feet away. Why is this happening to us? Hey, Papatas. We, we did it. We finally made it to the end. Okay, 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 calm down. Compose yourself, you still got the rest of the story to do. We reach the end of the dungeon and find ourselves at a lake with a glowing area in the center. That must be the time game. As we go to take a closer look though, a voice appears out of nowhere. It's Mesprit. They think that we stole the other time gears. Time for a fight. Now I'll be honest, since I played through the game before, I know that this fight isn't exactly the easiest, especially since we're probably very underleveled. So I've got a strategy in mind. First, set it up so that both Subscribe and I are next to each other before Mesprit begins. It also gives us some room to play with, which could come in handy. Then, spam moves. It's not a very eloquent strategy, but it's basically what we've got. After a few attacks, Mesprit gets hit with Leech Seed, which means that it's pretty much game over. Leech Seed doesn't wear off, so as long as we can stall long enough, Mesprit will lose 10 health every few turns. After some great battling by Subscribe and Adoran impersonating a slacking using Truon, we get the win. As we finish Mesprit off though, they're still insisting that we're the bad guys. But, but we aren't, it's supposed to be him. Grovile appears and pushes us out of the way along with Mesprit before trying to get to the time gear. He's just too fast for us, and we watch as the entire cave slowly loses time, literally, until time begins to stop. Also, we should leave before we get stuck in time. Let's move. We head back to the guild to report the news. We also learn that Mesprit is a she, a random point. Anyway, everyone is really impressed with what we've done, despite not doing too much, when Dustnor informs us of the trio that Mesprit and Yuxi are part of. Apparently there's a third Pokemon, Azelf, that fits in with the theme, and they could be guarding a lake similar to the other two. We narrow down that the lake is likely in a weird place, where Dustnor suggests using Bidoof's Crystal to try to trigger my dimensional scream. It works, and I see Grovile battling some blue Pokemon and talking about time gears. Looks like we're heading to Crystal Cave after all. Also, Wigglytuff hears all this in his sleep, which makes me wonder more about how goat tier Wigglytuff actually is. Anyway, let's pack up and travel to Crystal Cave. Hopefully we don't end up being underleveled or anything with this, even though we totally are. We get through the dungeon without too many issues and reach the bottom of Crystal Cave. There we see three extremely large crystals. They're able to change color. This must be a puzzle, similar to the Groudon statue in the quicksand area. But what could the puzzle be referring to? I get a dimensional scream about the puzzle, though it's words instead of the normal visual experience, which is also odd. But I guess we get to figure out what color exemplifies Azel. Maybe blue? We turn the crystals blue and it works, though I make sure to change slash get some items and save beforehand. As we turn them blue, a big beam of light is formed and eventually a cave entrance is visible. This must be it. Let's head down there and hope we aren't too late. We get a grass worm and animal on the 6th floor. On the 8th floor we recruit a Glamiao. On the 10th floor we find a secret bazaar. I take the opportunity to heal up both of us. On the 11th floor we end up in the monster house, in the same room where the stairs are. I try my best to cheese the system, but we get unlucky and I faint. Well, there go our new friends. We were doing so well before that though, so let's try again. We recruit an Absol on the 12th floor. On the 13th floor, you guessed it, Monster House. This time though, our strategy of warp two stairs plus get away works, and we leave the dungeon. 
As we get out of the dungeon, we see a really nice looking lake covered with crystals. However, we also see Grovile battling Azelf, and it looks like Grovile won. I guess our dimensional screen was a future event. We head out to try to stop him, but Azelf flips over the trap card and covers the lake with crystals, making it impossible to get the time gear. Hashtag mirror wall, if you know, you know. Nevertheless, Grovile wants what he wants, so it's up to us to stop him. The battle starts off really well. I wrap Grovile up and have Subscribe knock him around for a bunch of damage, but no matter how much we seem to do though, it doesn't seem to be enough. One absorb attack from him on Subscribe ends the battle. We lost. However, it actually doesn't matter how you do in this fight. Win or lose, the story continues, so you can imply that you're supposed to lose because the story doesn't change anyway. Anyway, we lose. I'm going to count this as a death, though you may not. As we are beat, Grovile looks like he's almost hesitating, but right before he attempts to deal the finishing blows to Subscribe, Dustnor shows up, and he's mad. Apparently Dustnor and Grovile have some history battling each other. Just when they look to fight though, Grovile uses something to make a flashing light that disappears. Dustnor, mad with rage, vanishes as well. As we fade out of consciousness, the rest of the guild shows up and takes us back to heal. We all need a break from this. We wake up to find Chimeko taking care of us. She goes on to explain that we were knocked out and everything seems to be okay. Also, as of as a he, legendaries with genders are fascinating to me for some reason. The rest of the guild comes in to check on us as well, when Subscribe informs everyone about the history between Dustnor and Grovile. As we discuss this new revelation, one of the Magnemite officers activates the emergency broadcast system to tell us all of a town meeting happening. Looks like we'll be learning more about what's going on now. The guild members head to the center of town, where it seems like everyone is waiting. Soon afterwards, the meeting begins. We get updates on the chase for Grovile when Dustnor decides to take the conversation from here. This is mind-blowing. Apparently Grovile is from the future, and he's a notorious criminal. He's been the reason why time is all out of whack, as the theft of the time gears leads to more mystery dungeons and criminals running loose. Dustnor is also from the future, and he's got the job of catching Grovile. That explains why he seems to know a bit about everything too. A decision is made. The spirit trio of Azelf, Mesprit, and Yuxi will pretend to head to Crystal Cave to seal away the time gear forever. When Grovile hits to stop it, Dustnor will catch him. Our job is to spread the rumors that Grovile can hear and fall into the trap, and that's what we're going to do. For the first time in what feels like a really long time, we go back to the regular mission grind. I'll update if anything interesting happens. Our egg happens to be a barboach, so that's another recruit. We also eat some gummies to boost our stats. Here's the before and after on your screen right now. While doing missions in Apple Woods, we recruit a Butterfree. We finish off this day's mission with some rewards, including Volbeat joining the team. That night, Subscribe talks to me about what happened that day, it just reminds us that we've got to trust us in order to do the right thing. I think that's what she said, I'm not sure. A doer in AK me was asleep. The next morning we get a quick update from Chatout about the trap, and it's mainly that we don't have any information, so continue doing what we do, so we do the thing we do when we gotta do the thing we do. While doing missions we get into a monster house, at least this one was planned by the criminal that we're trying to get, not too hard, but I thought it would be interesting to note. Missions done, rewards earned, etc. Subscribe and I have another heart-to-heart -heart discussion before going to bed, which seems to be our thing these days. The next morning, everything seems normal when Officer Magnemite comes in to tell us some good news. Grovile has been captured, and Dustnor is going back to the future with him. Dustnor apparently has a message for us that he wants to share, so the guild heads on out to see him off. There, we see the legendary trio of Mesprit, Azelf, and Yuxi all together in safe. We also see a large dark vortex, which presumably must be the dimensional hole that the officer was talking about. We wait for a bit before Dustnor comes in with a few other Pokemon, including Grovile. Gagged and bound, he isn't able to say a thing. Dustnor says his farewells and plans to return to the future with Grovile, though his comments about the world being safe are met with some resistance from Grovile for some reason. As everyone but Dustnor leaves, he calls Subscribe and me up to meet him. We say our farewells. But he doesn't do the same. Instead, he grabs us and drags us into the dimensional hole with him. I guess we're heading to the future! There's something happening outside of my consciousness, but I wouldn't know what it is. I'm busy in jail, yep. Turns out that as I wake up, Subscribe and I are in a jail for some reason. Everything seems extremely gray, but nothing doing. I even tried to open the cell doors myself, but it doesn't budge. Subscribe puts the pieces together and realizes that we are in the future, much to her shock. As she slowly comes to terms with this, some Pokemon come in and blindfold us, taking us to another location. We end up in a stockade tied to a post with none other than Grovile. The Pokemon are apparently Sableye, and they are Dustnor's underlings. It seems that they're planning to get rid of us, and Dustnor is all for it. Grovile asks me what I can do to help, so after a bit of discussion, we aim to attack at the right moment. We're successful, and we escape before the others know what's going on. Grovile digs a hole for us while the Luminous Orb takes effect, so the others would think that we left. Still, we've got to move quick before they figure out our scheme. As we escape, we look outside and see what the future looks like. 
and it's not pretty. Rocks are floating, the sky looks like it's constantly night, very bleak. All three of us keep running before we reach a dungeon. When we get there though, Subscribe and Grovile argue about working together. Grovile is for us to team up, while Subscribe doesn't seem to trust him. The way Dustnord has been acting recently though, I'm more willing to trust Grovile. The planet seems to be paralyzed anyway, despite what we did in saving the time gears. Anyway, we prepare to head off while Grovile leaves in advance. Time to explore the future. Now you may notice that this dungeon is very different from the others. This dungeon is weird in that there's no walls anywhere. It's almost like the entire dungeon is floating on air. Which is fun. A lot of tough Pokemon too, so let's hope I get through it easily. We get out of the dungeon without too much trouble when Subscribe and I end up near a flowing waterfall of some sort. The only thing is, the waterfall isn't flowing at all. It's stuck, and we've got no idea why. I try to use my dimensional screen, but for the first time, it doesn't seem to activate. That's very odd. Anyway, we've got to travel quick before the Sableye and Dustnor show up, so let's get packing and move on out. You can see that the dungeon looks somewhat normal. The thing is, the vast amount of ghost-type Pokemon can fight through walls while we can't attack them. The tough part is making sure that the ghost Pokemon are on the actual floor so that both of us can attack. It's a lot of different types of thinking in this case. Sure enough, about halfway through, we end up fainting due to us being stuck in a hallway. It's one of those things that's really annoying about ghost types in this game. We've got to find a way to always be battling in a room. And the next attempt of Pokemon sits on the stairs. I try to wake him up and move, but then I hit a sleeping trap, so ding ding ding, knockout. Also, because I quick saved in the dungeon, I lose all of my items and all of my money. I did that once early in the run, but I wasn't sure if that was due to the quick save or not. Well, not doing that again. Time to stock up. At least I don't have to worry about storage space. Yay. Also, because I only have one extra power band, I give subscribe a special band. Now, that changes the likelihood of knockouts and a bunch of other stuff due to the move pool. See earlier in the run for more information. We get through the dungeon much better this time and continue on our trek when we see a large patch of lights in the distance. The stockade. Subscribe is feeling pretty down, and who can blame her? It's just us in a world unfamiliar to us, with no idea what's going on, and why things are the way they are. I suggest finding Grovile and seeing if he's got an idea on how to go from the future to our normal timeline, and Subscribe hesitantly agrees. We're in a tricky spot, but if Dustnor is against us, then we need Grovile. We continue traveling together, our team stronger than ever, when we reach another dungeon. Time to stock up and head in. So, fourth floor, Monster House, you know what happens next. I really hate that these monster houses feel like they're mandatory. I mean, they're where the stairs are, and I can't just use an orb to freeze everyone or something. One more fading, and I get a free sandwich, though. If we're on track. Halfway through, and this dungeon feels much easier. Not too much trouble, as long as there aren't any monster houses. Though, I'm prepared for them, as long as they aren't in the same room as the stairs. I hope that Grovile is doing okay. Especially since we need him. It would be really bad if something bad is happening to him right now. On the fifth floor, we get into a monster house. This time the strategy works pretty well. I warp to the stairs on one turn, then subscribe warps to a random location on the second. That way neither of us are stuck with all those Pokemon. Here's hoping we don't get another one because I don't have another pure seed for the strategy. As we exit the dungeon, it seems that Grovile is trapped by some purpley force. Spiritomb comes out and demands to pick a fight with us, so we fight. It starts off poorly as Spiritomb sucker punches from a distance. Then things seem to turn around as we approach them with an accuracy drop and a cringe, but somehow, Subscribe at low health uses Drain Punch, healing them to the point where the next attack would not activate my IQ ability to dive and take the damage for myself. What are the odds of that? Uh, let's try again. This time around the dungeon goes a lot smoother and the final battle begins again. This time we charge forward and try to taunt, not the move, the spirit tomb into attacking us instead of setting up a nasty plot. We get a confusion and a smoke screen along the way which makes the battle significantly easier. After a few hits, they go down. As the battle ends, Spiritomb stops possessing Grovile and runs away. We check on Grovile, sees that he's okay, and then asks him about this world. We'll see if he's legitimately telling the truth or just saying things. We end up hiding out for a bit so we can talk. So, who are you, Grovile? Who are you really? Well, we learn quite a bit. The world's paralysis is due to the collapse of Temporal Tower, governed by Dialga, the legendary Pokemon of time. In our time, the tower collapsed, and Dialga slowly became consumed by darkness. He's now known as Primal Dialga. Dustnor is part of the forces to keep the world paralyzed, while Grovile is part of the people trying to stop the paralysis. Collecting time gears and delivering them to Temporal Tower would apparently solve the issues. It all makes sense to both Subscribe and me, despite the shock of being betrayed. Subscribe nearly heads to Dustnor to ask him about this before Grovile snaps her back to reality. It's clear though, we've got to trust Grovile and hope that he and the Celebi Pokemon can bring us back to our normal timeline. We end up in a forest that feels very familiar for some odd reason, and the place where Celebi apparently is. Though, if Celebi is helping us, they're also being targeted by Dialga crew, which means we've got to be extra careful. With that said, time to get to work. 
As we leave, Subscribe still doesn't completely trust Grovile for some reason. I also remember this place reminds me of the expedition, but I still don't know why. Anyway, let's head out. We'll have Grovile with us for a while, which makes the challenge significantly easier. Since it's got a bunch of levels on us and a legitimate moveset, traveling will likely be easier as well. Same rules apply to us though, so this challenge is still on. We get through without any issues and appear in the clearing when Celebi shows up. Whoa, she's a shiny, shiny Pokemon alert. Someone grab a Master Ball or something. Anyway, she seems particularly interested in two different things. One, making sure that we get back through the passage of time, a way to travel over long distances of time, and B, me for some reason. Not sure why, but okay. We travel a bit more and have another dungeon to travel through, so let's get packing. I also want to share this amazing dialogue with you. That's right, our little Celebi friend has a crush on Grovile, and I totally ship them. Am I a 21 year old man shipping two Pokemon from a game made over 10 years ago? Absolutely, at me if you want, follow me on Twitter while you're at it. Okay, now dungeon time. The same thing as last time when it comes to Grovile joining us, except now it's Grovile and Celebi. She's a great support Pokemon, especially if we need to heal status effects and other things like that. Plus, look at the levels, we're a stacked team. Though, we're so stacked that on the fifth floor I decided that I should take out subscribe as well as the Steelix with a magnitude. Look at me, hashtag big brain and all that. Though, I've never seen the dialogue when I faint at this point, so I talk to Celebi and hear some more about this adorable crush talk. Yep, this is who I am. Anyway, let's redo this dungeon and maybe not knock out my allies? Yeah, good idea. This time, it goes much smoother, and we're able to get out of the dungeon and see the passage of time, which would take us back to our own time. Then, Dusnor appears, with this Sableye henchman. No matter though, because we can just go and beat him up! Easy peasy! Wait, who's that? Primal Dialga? Oh, biscuits. That's not good. Finding these guys is one thing, but a legendary of Dialga's magnitude? No, thank you. Grovile just flat out surrenders, though it seems that someone else was with him on his travels to the past. Maybe that person can save the day. Why is Dustmore laughing? Wait, his name is Adurin? Oh, double biscuits. Yup, turns out I'm a human from the future who came to the main time period to stop the paralysis of the world with Grovile. Some accident occurred that led me to losing my memory and becoming a Pokemon, which Destinor was able to use to his advantage. Now it's really like all hope is lost when Subscribe has a plan. If we can use Celebi's time travel to transport us to the passage, we could get by. As we do that though, Dialga uses his powers to stop the time travel just short. We dive into the passageway and Celebi disappears, closing the portal behind her. So that just happened. All three of us wake up on the beach where our journey began, and it looks like we all made it back to the past. Seems like last time, when I ended up here, Grovile ended up at the Eastern Forest. Subscribe suggests at first to head back to the guild, but that doesn't make much sense since Grovile is still a criminal in their eyes. Subscribe seems to have another place in mind though, so let's check that place out. Subscribe leads us to Sharpedo Bluff, where behind a bush is a secret passage to the mouth of the rock formation. Apparently Subscribe used to live here before joining the guild. We head into a pretty spacious location. And that night, we discuss more about my past, clarifying details about who I was. Grovile and I were a Pokemon human partnership, and we researched time gears before coming to this time. The dimensional screen requires a trusted Pokemon partner to activate, which makes Subscribe a really quickly trusted Pokemon partner. The past and future seem to activate different visions as well, as in the future, it's only time gear related stuff, while the dimensional screen activates other sorts of visions in the current time, like the drowsy situation, for example. Anyway, we make plans to start collecting time gears again the next day. That night, while I'm asleep, Grovile wakes up to see that Subscribe is outside, thinking about all of the events that have gone on over the past couple of weeks. They discuss how impressive something that you take for granted is, such as the sunrise. They also discuss the importance of friendship. At the end of the day, this is one of two different parts of the entire story that I think really hits me deep, especially when I'm feeling down. If you made it this far but haven't seen a regular playthrough of this, I'd highly recommend checking this specific part out and just simply soaking in what they say. The morning rises and we've got to figure out where to go. While the closest area would be one of the lakes, Grovile suggests heading to Tree Shroud Forest, where he got the first time here. There's no one guarding it like the lakes, so it's a better place to go. We head on out there. When there, something seems to be off, though none of us are exactly sure what it is. We prepare and head into the forest to get our first time here. On the 15th floor, I should note this is a very long dungeon, it's a monster house. Luckily, I prepared with the pure scene. Bounced into the stairs room, crossed my finger that subscribe would last two moves, which she did, and we moved on to the next floor. We get to the end of the dungeon rather easily, and we notice something bad. Time is still stopped, despite the time gear supposedly being put back. We head over to where the time gear is supposed to be, and sure enough the time gear is there, but time is stopped. Everything outside seems to be perfectly still. Grovile takes the time gear, and nothing really happens. 
After that, Grovile asks Subscribe to go to the treasure town and gather information, which he does while lying low. Back at our base, Subscribe comes in with bad news. Despite the time gears being put back to where they're supposed to be, time didn't start up again. Worse, the stoppage of time seems to be spreading quickly. Grovile tells us that this likely means the temporal tower is collapsing, which means that the paralysis of the world is starting. Grovile suggests splitting up. He'll go to gather the time gears while we figure out how to get to the hidden land, the place where the temporal tower is. He heads out while we head to the beach, trying to think of how we could cross the sea. I mean, I'm a munchlax, I probably don't float, and subscribing a skitty probably isn't a fan of water. We end up staring off into the distance, with no idea of what to do. When I think of an idea, we need help. We've got to ask the guild. It's time to reveal ourselves. We need everyone to A. Believe in us and our task, and B. Figure out where this hidden land could be. After a bit of discussion, it's time. We're heading home. The return of Team Not a Scratch has come. We head back to the guild, and Subscribe stands on the entrance grate. In about 4.22 seconds, everyone runs out of the guild, and they're all really excited to see us again. We head inside to tell our story, cause it's a long one. Chatop basically restates the entire story, though he embellishes in certain areas, before basically calling us delusional and tells us to take a nap. This was slightly shocking to us. Chatop really gets angry about it too, as if we'd lie about a story that took 2-3 to three hours of gameplay. Even the other guild members are hesitant at first. Then the Pokemon that started this entire saga, Bidoof, proclaims his opinion. He believes us. He'd rather believe us than Dusnor, cause we're, as the great Wigglytuff once said, friendly friends. Every other guild member claims that the trust we built together is more important, and that we wouldn't lie about a serious thing like this. Wigglytuff comes forward and proclaims that, much to our surprise, everyone is in agreement. Yes, even Chadot, who was testing our teamwork this entire time, and I have absolutely no reason not to believe that. Wigglytuff makes it our new priority to find the hidden land, and tells us to meet up with the elder Torkoal, who may know more about how to get there. So tomorrow, we head out to the hot spring to meet up with Torkoal. The next day rolls around and we head off to Waterfall Cave, but before that, time to do some errands. From our egg, a Weedle hatches. We also use the gummies we collected to boost our stats. You're seeing the before and after of the stat boost. Plus, it clears space and storage, which is pretty close to full right now. We head over to Waterfall Cave, go through the dungeon, and end up in the hot spring, where we talk with Torkoal. He tells us what he knows, which unfortunately isn't much. The hidden land has been passed down in lore as a place of great mystery, and he needs some sort of proof of identification that chooses the Pokemon that are allowed to go. It's not too much, but it's something. We head back home without too much progress by anyone, but continue to push forward. A new day means a new chance to find out something new. That's a lot of news in that sentence. Anyway, the next day, we wake up trying to think of what to do when Torkoal comes to the guild. He seems to remember one small detail that he wants to tell us. It has something to do with the proof. Apparently, the proof has some intricate pattern that's odd looking and difficult to describe. Now, where have we heard that before? Yep, turns out all this time, Subscribe has had the proof with her all along. Wigglytuff and Chatter also mentioned that in Brine Cave, they saw that exact symbol. Looks like we're heading to Brine Cave tomorrow, after stocking up on supplies. Chatter will be joining us on the journey as well, as a ruthless bandit apparently lives there. So, let's get prepared for the journey. Also, I should mention, Torkoal leaves. I assume he went home or something, but it's, uh, it's nice to seem that we made him remember the good old days of hip and joy and happiness. While preparing, Subscribe reminds us that we should check the bluff to see if Grovile has a message or something. We head over there to find a note from Grovile about his travels. He's already over halfway done, and things seem to be much easier than last time. Though he does bring up the fact that Dustnor could come back, which would be, you know, slightly problematic. He says he'd either meet us at this base or on the beach, so we head to the beach to see if he's there. We head to the beach and don't find Grovile. We also don't find any Krabby, which is kind of surprising. Anyway, we both reminisce about the first time we met on the beach, which also had to do with the Relic Fragment. We've grown up so much since then, and Subscribe is definitely more confident in herself nowadays. We also see a Pokemon seemingly swimming in the distance, well that's kind of odd. Anyway, we head back to the guild and absolutely nothing else happens. How would I know? I went home, remember? Even that night, it's not like that swimming Pokemon was meeting my favorite boss in the world or anything, right? You know, normal stuff. Anyway, the next morning, the guildmaster isn't back, so it looks like Chatot is in charge. Yay. Apparently the rest of the guild agrees with me that Chadot isn't quite the guildmaster, but we end up motivating him as much as he tries to motivate us, and we head off to Brine Cave. At Brine Cave, Chadot reminds us of the goals that we have to face, and gives some hints on who that big boss at the end of the dungeon was. Turns out that boss has some helpers, and we've got to deal with water type moves, which technically narrows it down, though there's still a bunch of Pokemon it could be. 
Anyway, on this journey, Chaddock is joining us, so same sort of situation like when Bidoof, Grovile, and Celebi joined us. Let's go. We get halfway through easily, and Chaddock reminds us that we're getting closer to the vicious Pokemon, when out of nowhere, Team Skull shows up. They barge into us and take our Relic Fragment. Chaddock is only just now realizing that Team Skull is a bad team of crooks as they head to the end of Brine Cave. And Chaddock snaps. He tosses some choice words to Team Skull that I will not repeat for uh, my moral code, then chases after them. Looks like it's just going to be us for the rest of the way. On the fourth floor, we faint to a critical hit poison jab after double screech. You know what? I, I deserve that death. That was just impressive. Let's restart. This time we get through pretty easily and reach the end of the cave where we find Team Skull nearly knocked out. Apparently they were attacked by the Pokemon we were warned about before, much to their surprise. Tata also uses some choice words, which I appreciate. While I say nothing, Subscribe tries to help them out, despite all they've done to us. I suppose Skunk Tank is grateful, because he drops the Relic Fragment on purpose, allowing us to pick it up. Though he states that they'll be back to his old tricks sooner or later. I guess we'll see them later? We head to the next room where Chaddock is looking for the bandits. He's slowly remembering that they attacked him out of nowhere, but actually, from the ceiling. He warns us, but we don't see them, and Chaddock takes the hit for us, saying that we're his prized recruits. Alright, Chaddock, you've got us on your side. Time to take these fools out. That's our boss you're attacking here. Unfortunately, despite some good luck, we're not able to get this win. Just too much damage on me, which isn't the type of strategy that works well. The best way is for Subscribe to take a lot of the damage, and then I cover for her at the end. Let's try this again. Okay, did I say try it again? I meant after this one. Yeah, let's just not talk about it. Try the battle again, but not nearly as lucky as last time. This time you were able to get the Yomastar Brothers out, but we were this close to being able to get Kabutops out. Probably one hit away too. Now this time, it's important that we win because I'd like to not have more deaths than recruits, and I'm pretty sure we're at that point. I've kind of lost track of how many deaths they are while writing this script. Uh, you can see the counter though. This time, I make sure everyone comes towards me, and both Subscribe and I go for the Omastar Brothers. Subscribe gets off a Giga Impact, which makes this slightly easier to deal with, as I finish off the other Omastar. Then, it's us two versus Kabatops. An Air Slash Cringe gives us a free turn, and Sacred Fire burns Kabatops to lower attack. Scary Face lowers her speed, but we replace the burn with Poison, not sure why we did that. Despite the mega-draining efforts, we get another cringe, and Charge Beam finishes off what has been the most annoying battle so far. Best believe I was fist-pumping the air when I finally won. After we won the battle, the bandits flee and Chatot looks really hurt. Wigglytuff and Grovile come in soon afterwards, followed by the rest of the guild. Everyone else in the guild takes Chatot back to be healed, while Subscribe, Grovile, and I continue forward to the Relic Fragment symbol. We move ahead and find the symbol on the wall. Placing the Relic Fragment results in a beam of light being shot forward, and Lapras appears. Apparently, Lapras is the Pokemon that can lead travelers to the Hidden Land, so we all climb aboard and start our travels. It's time to go to the Hidden Land. Let's see what we find. Chaddot seems to be getting better, as he needs a night's sleep and some time to recover. At this point, we learn more about how Wigglytuff knew about Lapras and the Relic Fragment symbol. Chaddot saved Wigglytuff while they were exploring the dungeon, similar to how he did for us, and Lapras helped Chaddot afterwards. Wigglytuff also made a deal with Lapras to never investigate the symbol, as it had to do with the Hidden Land. Dialga feared intruders coming to the Hidden Land, which is apparently a gap in time itself. Dialga left one key to enter, the Relic Fragment. The night before we traveled to Brine Cave, Wigglytuff met with Lapras to tell him about the problems that the world is facing, and that it was time for someone to travel to the Hidden Land. Also, the Relic Fragment itself chooses a worthy individual, in this case Subscribe, to carry it. At this point though, it's up to us. Just Subscribe, Grovile, and Adurin as we tried to save the world. The next morning, Lapras informs us that we'll be able to see the gap in time, which shows up as some glitchy thing on our screen. Then, Lapras starts basically flying in the air as we see, for the first time, the hidden land. Once we land, Lapras shows us Temporal Tower, the twisted thing on the top left, and the location of Dialga. To get there, we've got to take the Rainbow Stone Ship, which is later on. With that said, it's time to prepare. Also, did you know that you could just head back to Treasure Town? Yeah, I didn't know this when I first played through the game, but you could just go back and do stuff there, so I'm, a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm gonna do that. So after preparing ourselves, you can see the items and stats for both Subscribe and myself. I'm hoping that the metronome luck is good, as I'm not sure how easy it'll be to head back to Treasure Town from this point. Once we go through the dungeon, I'm fairly certain that there's no going back. One more save for the road, then we head off. Halfway through, with some small but not too crazy scares, Grovile's really helped as a third teammate, even if he isn't using the metronome. In fact, it's probably because he's not using metronome. Let's move on to the next levels. We get to the old ruins and see a bunch of inscriptions and paintings of legends of the world. Mew, Kyogre and Groudon, Palkia and Dialga. As we exit the cave, we reach a temple. We climb up it and find a message on a stone. Apparently, we're standing on the rainbow stone ship. 
The relic fragment gets placed in the center, and it transports us to Temporal Tower. Just before we can, though, we hear a voice. And save a life. You know what this means. Yep, Dustnor is back. And this time, he's not going to give up without a fight. It's time to fight Dustnor and the six Sableye. The plan for us is pretty straightforward. I go for Dustnor, while the other two basically do whatever they feel like. I get off a really lucky Super Fang, which cuts Dustnor's health in half, and we slowly whittle down the other Pokemon. At the very end of the battle, I'm immobilized, and Grovile is too far away. It's just subscribe and one Sableye. All of us are on low health. Metronome? Into magnitude. RIP us, we were so close! Time to try again. I'm telling you, the first round was just such good luck, this time we don't even get past the third floor. This time against Dustnor, we don't get the luck that we need, and another faints happen. Well, this time, double ancient power knocks me out on the fifth floor. A monster house on the first floor, and where the stairs are. Counted as a death. This time against Dustnor, we get some luck with Endeavor, but subscribe faints. I'm also spending a lot of time on these battles, and I'd like to get this video out soon, so I'm going to use the special features uh, of the way that I'm playing the game so I can try these again. I, I, I'm afraid that the cutscenes just finally got to me, and I'm personally a huge cutscene fan. So uh, don't tell the higher-ups, but we're using the special features, my apologies. Uh, welcome to a montage of all of the efforts. It's fun.
After what felt like a billion attempts, I don't actually know, you can check on the screen, there's probably something there, we finally got him. I'll be honest, I have no idea how exactly we won this battle. <laughs> you might have noticed that the strategy was to have Subscribe and Grow Vile attack the Sableye while I went for Dustnor at first, but then Dustnor got confused in this run, which changed the game. I mentioned a long time ago that the overall strategy with these metronome runs are to 1. Make sure that everyone is able to fight someone, 2. Attack as much as possible, 3. Get all the status effect and stat drops. Somehow we were able to get rid of all the Sableye before Dustnor regained his senses. I personally would like to think that we not only won this battle, but we won it while only using Metronome and with Desnor having a power band, which he picked up during the fight. The IQ skills that I have, which makes me a shield for my partner, really helps, especially Grovile. His ability Overgrow boosts his grass type moves when he's at low health, and my IQ skill helps keep him alive at that low health mark. His Leaf Blade, which did over 300 damage, finished off Desnor. We finally get the win, but as we do, Desnor and the Sableye still have energy and attack back. Desnor charges a massive Shadow Ball looking attack, but we blast it back to him, knocking him out. The Sableye run away into the dimensional hole. Grovile tells Subscribe to activate the Rainbow Stone Ship, while he and I watch over Dusnor. As she goes, Dusnor comments that we would disappear if we changed the future, much to my surprise. This was something that we agreed to do, however, before coming here. We had nothing to go back to. Nothing to lose. However, over this journey, I did gain something that I would definitely lose. My friend Subscribe. If we disappear, it would crush her. We still have a job to do, though, so we'll do it anyway. Dustnor apparently also has a job to do, which he tries to sneak up on us with, by attacking me, then Grovile. However, Grovile decides to push Dustnor into the dimensional hole, along with himself. Before Grovile leaves, he drops the time gears and gives us the motivation we need to push forward and become the heroes the world needs. Both Dustnor and Grovile jump into the dimensional hole, and it vanishes. It's now only us two left, as we try to save the world. We grab the time gears as the Rainbow Stone ship starts yelling at us to get on board before it leaves. We rush up the stairs and onto the platform, and the stone ship begins to move, leaving a rainbow trail behind itself. We land on the pathway leading to the Temporal Tower, though there's a big red cloud that's a bit concerning. Time to prepare for the dungeon. As my character said earlier, this is our final adventure. Let's go. Two floors in, we faint. Look, this dungeon is going to be tough. Like, really tough. My goal is to have less than 100 deaths. Uh, you can see how we're doing. The next run in, we get three floors in. Yay, something tells me I am not prepared at all. This time we do better getting to floor 11, but it's still rough. I'm thinking we've got to head back and train. The problem, of course, is that we'll have to go through the hidden land again, which is a pain, but the early 30s is not high enough for us to last a long time here. So I've got some clips of interesting dojo training that I did here. While researching for this challenge, one place that was a great place to level up was the Dragon Maze in the dojo. The final floor has Pokemon regularly giving out 400 to 500 experience, which is a lot better than most dungeons. It's also basically on par with the hidden land, with two extra benefits. One, deaths don't count in the dojo, so that just makes me feel better, and two, I can take my time and battle everyone without too much hassle. The strategy was straightforward once I finished all of the mazes. By the way, I finished all of the mazes. I went to the dragon maze and continued until the fifth or last floor. Once I found the stairs on that floor, I would hold A and B to skip my turn and just wait for Pokemon to come to me. We'd basically do this until that mystical timer force was about to kick us out, then we'd bounce. So, we're level 36 right now, but we've also got two joy seeds that will boost us to 37. We got one of them from much earlier in the game, I think it was one of the sentry duty tasks, and the other from completing all the dojos. We've also got a life seed which boosts HP. I decided to give that to subscribe. Along with that, I used a lot of the stat boosting drinks on both of us to boost our stats. I don't know if I mentioned this before, but I'm not counting deaths in the dojo as deaths in the run, otherwise this would likely be in the thousands. Maybe not, but you get the point. Also should point out, my script has lost track of how many deaths there are as I mentioned before, so I don't actually know how many times I fainted. Uh, my current count at this point is 53, but I know I've missed a few as I record this. Anyway, here's what we look like going into the Hidden Land for the second time. Much stronger, and hopefully it's enough to actually get up Temporal Tower. I'll see you in a bit. Hi, I wasn't expecting to see you this quick, so let's just ignore this. Look, I'm a bit farther ahead, I got to the halfway checkpoint at least. Okay, so maybe we did need Grovile for this part. Look, I see I see y'all in the comment section, That that's, that's fine. Come on, it was three on two, what was I supposed to do? Okay, now that we finally have come back, to the bottom of Temporal Tower. Let's see if we can make it to the top. On the sixth floor, we start off in the Monster House, which is, you know, not great. It doesn't help that the stairs are here as well, but A1 strategy takes effect. Subscribe warps away with a warp seed, and I cross my finger that I don't get knocked out. I then use a warp seed and somehow end up in the same room. That's just pure luck. We chill there for a bit, stalling to get the Pokemon out of the Monster House. Right when I start seeing Pokemon, I pure seed into the stairs room, and we move on, avoiding the Monster House. Bang. So, we made it halfway. 
and tremors continue to happen, much to our worry. With more tremors comes a higher probability that the tower will collapse, and so we should probably solve it before the tower collapses. Yeah, let's go. Then, on floor 3, Salamets. Yep, gotta face them. <sighs> Sighs loudly. I have that in my script because I'm sighing loudly. On this run, the first floor has a monster house, so pure seed strat for the win. We make it to the top floor, and I will apologize about something in just a second. What you see on the screen right now is basically subscribe and a door and realizing, hey, this is the top of Temporal Tower. Time gear should go in the back. There's a panel for it. Flash of lightning, Primal Dialga shows up, basically thinks that we caused this because he's getting consumed by darkness. We gotta fight and beat him. Great. Now the apology. I, which you may or may not have seen, used the special save feature that only certain devices that play this game can have. I used this mainly because it was late at night when I was recording this, and I had planned to be done with this two days ago, so... Whoops. Anyway, time to see how long this death montage is. I quickly learned the strategy behind the battle through a lot of trial and error. First, I need to make sure that both Subscribe and I chase after Dialga in the beginning. Subscribe sometimes stays back, which doesn't help us try to get the maximum amount of damage possible. Second, I have to switch off one of my IQ skills which has me step backwards if one of my moves misses. It's normally extremely useful, but Dialga has Roar of Time, a room hitting move, which makes where I am in the room not very important, it's gonna hit us anyway. Third, I pray to Arceus that Dialga does not start with Roar of Time and instead rushes at us. The attempt is basically over with if he uses that move at the start, so that's an aspect of it that's not under my control. Finally, we attack and cross our fingers. What you're seeing right now is over 40 attempts across nearly an hour of recording, just attempt after attempt, resetting if it didn't work. It was brutal. Did I succeed or give up? Well, I'll let the music play and you can watch to find out.
Yes! We finally won the battle. Ignore the death counter. That's a win in our book. We're just gonna pretend like the death counter doesn't exist. Also, we should probably put the time gears in before things get really bad. So subscribe puts them in, but things aren't working. Uh, it looks really bad. Dive for cover! After the flash of light, we wake up and see that things are more stable? Also, there's Dialga, and he seems calmer. Dialga explains that time is now flowing better, and shows us Tree Shroud Forest, with time flowing again. Treasure Town also looks good as well, which must mean that we saved the day. Team Not a Scratch did it! Alright then, time to head home. As we leave the tower though, it's becoming even harder to move. Oh, it's time. We've got to go. The future has changed, so that means it's time for us to go. At this point, I'm going to switch from post-game Adoran to the in-game Adoran, and just be in the scene. Just absorb the moment. Enjoy what little voice acting skills I have, and try not to cry. Hey, Adoran. Huh? Adoran? What is it? What's happening to you? Sorry, subscribe. I kept this to myself for a long time. It looks like I have to say goodbye. What? Goodbye? What are you saying? Dustnor told me. If we change the future, the Pokemon from the future would disappear. That's why I'm destined to disappear, too. Huh? What? Why? What? Why? I don't understand. Thank you for everything. I'm going to disappear from here now. But subscribe. I'll never forget you. But wait a second. I managed to make it this far only because you were with me, Adoran. Don't you understand? You made me strong, Adoran. If you go, Adoran, I... I don't know what I would... No, subscribe. You have to be strong on your own. You have to live. You have to go home. Tell everyone about what happened here. So that nothing like this happens ever again. Er, Adoran... The light. The light is getting brighter. Don't, Adoran. Don't. Don't go. Thank you for everything, subscribe. I'm glad we got to train together at the guild. I'm glad we got to go on adventures together. I'm glad I got to know you, subscribe. Please, wait, Adoran. I'm sorry. I'm so lucky that you were my friend. I feel the same, Adoran. To me, Adoran, you're more important than anything. Yes, I feel the same way. Subscribe, even after I disappear from here, I will never forget you. Adoran? Adoran! Adoran! I have to live. I have to get home alive. Get home and tell everyone about what happened. Because it's Adoran's... It's Adoran's last wish. Th there's... There's the Rainbow Stone ship. Temporal Tower is getting farther and farther away. And Adoran. I'm getting farther away from Adoran. Oh, Adoran. And so, Adoran and Subscribe finally succeeded in their mission and saved the world from disaster. Subscribe departed from Temporal Tower, traveled across the ravaged hidden land, rode Lapras across the sea, and safely returned to Treasure Town. Upon returning to the guild, Subscribe told everyone about the adventure, about what had happened in the Hidden Land, about what took place in Temporal Tower, about Grovile, and about Adoran. Of course, Subscribe also spoke of how the destruction of time was stopped, and how the world was restored to peace. Subscribe told the story whenever and wherever possible, to as many Pokémon as possible. It was a story that had to be told. It was a story of hope for world peace. It was a story of hope for future peace. So months passed. Treasure Town returned to its cheerful routines. The scars from the planet's injuries slowly healed, and life gradually returned to normal.
Huh? How do you subscribe? Going out? Yep, out for a walk. Sounds nice, yep, yep. It'll be dinner time soon, though. Don't want to be late for that. Yep, I hear you. Oh wow, this is so pretty. I haven't seen this for a long time. It's as pretty as I remember. I've been too busy to come see it, but I've missed this fantastic sight. When was the last time I saw this anyway? The last time was... Oh, the last time was... It was when... When I met a Durin. Someone has collapsed on the sand. What happened? Are you okay? The view was like this that time, too. The crabby blowing all those bubbles along the beach. I noticed someone right here. Adurin was unconscious. That was when Adurin and I... That was when our adventure began. Would you form an exploration team with me? I think we could make a good exploration team together, Doran. So, will you do that with me, please? Uh-oh, my stomach growled. <laughs> your stomach growled too, Doran. I guess we must be famished. We were so focused on rescuing Azuro that I didn't notice at all. But now I'm even hungrier. Come on, let's go get dinner, Doran. I'm gonna believe in you, Doran. Yes, I totally believe in you, Adoran. I realized I did the right thing in becoming an exploration team member. One day, I'm sure I'll solve the secret of my relic fragment. That's my dream. If it ever came true, I'd surely faint from happiness. <laughs> oh, I'm scared. But it's time to be brave, and I need to stand up to this. We can't just run away now, Adorin. Are you taking in this view, Adorin? This is utterly magical. Hey! There's a break in the rope. No, attack! Adorin, thank you. You tried to cheer me up because I was feeling down. Let's always do our best, Adorin. So let's go for it. Let's jump into that quicksand pit, Adorin. Let's go, Adorin. We're off to Azelf's Lake. Adorin, we have to. We have to get back. Back to our own world. Hey, Adorin. We have to do this for Grove Isle's sake. Let's go to Temporal Tower. I remember it all so fondly. All those memories of my time with Adorin. Memories of Adorin. But now Adorin is gone. And Adorin isn't here anymore. Whoa, subscribe. You've been gone for so long I took to worrying about you. What's the matter? Badoom. Badoom. <laughs> what? what? What all is the matter? And that's the end of the challenge. That was a lot of fun. It was really challenging at times, which you could probably see whenever the death counter jumped up a lot. With that said though, it was amazing to come back to my favorite game of all time and add a challenge to it. I learned even more about the games and found new things that I never knew about them. Spin-off games like the Explorer games have a solid fan base, but I've never seen many, if any, challenges on these games. I'm glad I was able to do this and glad that you watched through the entire thing. The script right now is over 19,000 words long, though I'm probably going to cut it down a bit after the fact. If you're interested in another Pokemon challenge, let me know. This might not be a weekly or bi-weekly thing, but maybe once a month? Not too sure yet, this was just a challenge that I got really interested in doing. Shout out to my dry bread, Johnstone, and all of the other Pokemon challenge peoples on YouTube. You've been awesome to watch over the past few years, and I'm hoping this was at least half as entertaining as yours are. 
Let me know of any challenge ideas in the comments below. And if you haven't subscribed or left a like, please do. Not only does it help the channel, but you get updates on other gameplay videos like the Ace Attorney series or the Henry Stickman series on the channel right now. You can also follow me on Twitter at Adoran Region if you've got any ideas of future challenges that sound interesting to watch. Check out the channel in the description for more details on all this, and I guess I'll just leave you at that. Until next time everyone, take care. Subscribe when you left here, when you bid farewell to this place from the Rainbow Stone Ship. Your sorrow, I felt its intensity even here, and if that is how you feel even now, and if a Durin were to share those feelings, I will grant your wish. The world needs you both. That is why I will trust you with the gift. I leave to you the future. This is my thanks. Please accept it. So if you're here, I suppose I should ask. Post game? This voice acting thing might have been the greatest or worst thing in the history of mankind. <laughs>